Many people regard you as a personification of Ubuntu. What do you understand Ubuntu to be? In the old days, when we were young, <clears throat> a traveler through a country would stop at a village <clears throat> and uh, he didn't have to ask for food or for water. Once he stops, the people give him food, entertain him. That is one aspect of Ubuntu, but it will have various aspects. Ubuntu does not mean that people should not enrich themselves. The question, therefore, is, are you going to do so in order to enable the community around you uh, to be able to improve? These are the important things in life. And if one can do that, we have done something very important which will be appreciated. From WBRN Radio in Boston and on the Boston Red Network, the Open Source Report on the 9th of August 2017. We always start this out uh, with Nelson Mandela explaining what Ubuntu is and how it applies in everyday life. Thus, this is how we set our program up and how our work, the software development, open source and open source hardware work, is uh, done at uh, Cranston Software. Nonetheless, the kernel is 4.12.5. That's the latest kernel. We usually, this is the latest Linux kernel, incidentally. And I think we're using uh, 4.9.41. That is the uh, stable kernel, long-term stable kernel, the one we're using. And our... uh, Distribution is a Slackware, Slackware 14, uh, the latest one out there. Nonetheless, we're continuing our uh, discussion of the Google affair, we'll call it, Mr. Uh, James Damore. Uh, we have some audio from uh, Mr. Uh, James Damore, which we will put here, and we also have uh, his uh, document in its... Uh, entirety uh, here and we uh, uh, appreciative to uh, the uh, libertarian, let's see what is his name Stefan uh, Modlex uh, is an Irish uh, born uh, person that was uh, reared in uh, Canada he is a libertarian, he has a show here and uh, He also posted the entire document by uh, Mr. Uh, Damore. And you'll hear Mr. Damore in his own uh, words. And the document itself is uh, is posted here in its entirety. He does have some graphics in it. And I was looking here to see what his sites are, but uh, we don't see sites. But what we do see is some... uh, anecdotal information here for example he says communism promises to be both moral and economically uh, superior to capitalism but every attempt uh, became a morally uh, corrupt and and, an economic failure as it becomes clear that uh, the working class of the uh, liberal uh, democracies uh, weren't uh, going uh, to overthrow them, uh, uh, their uh, capitalist oppressors. The Marxist intellectual transformation for class war to gender war and race politics, the core um, oppressor, uh, oppressed uh, dynamic uh, remains, but now the oppressor is uh, the white, straight, uh, hmm, Interesting here. Gendered uh, patriarchy. Anyway. And he also has uh, something here about, uh, he doesn't sort from whence he comes, but uh, ironically, IQ tests were initially uh, championed by the left uh, 
when uh, meteorocracy uh, meant uh, helping the victims of uh, the aristocracy. Well, there are a lot of things going on here, but I wish he would have cited uh, more information from where it uh, comes. Uh, but again, he talks about the harmful uh, biases at uh, Google. No doubt Google has some quote-unquote quote, uh, harmful uh, biases. And he goes on in, uh, here, uh, one of his little caveats for heterose heterosexual, excuse me, romantic relationships. Men are uh, strongly judged uh, by status, women uh, by beauty. Well, so what? Anyway, this is the sort of thing here. Will appends this in the uh, report, and you hear his voice in the audio. Uh, he appears to be a very uh, naive uh, person, even as uh, this uh, Stefan uh, Modlix, uh, I think that's how you pronounce his name, hopefully, uh, guides him a few through the interview from a libertarian standpoint. But they do have to agree on certain things that Google is under a lot of pressure uh, to diversify. But where he is incorrect here, there is a lot of studies, or there are, I should say, a lot of studies on diversity out there. And uh, we'll uh, bring some of those up in future uh, casts. We won't deal with it now uh, as such. But what we will, we'll fall back on, of all things, uh, Financial Times, one of our favorite uh, magazines here as an economist. Anyway, this was uh, written uh, in the uh, in in the uh, yeah, Financial Times on August the eighth, and it's entitled "Googler's uh, Memo Shows That There Is a Work to Be Done." No doubt about that. And I'll read from it. Uh, Female coders uh, took us to the moon. And uh, Margaret uh, Hamilton uh, led the, uh, the lab that developed the Apollo program uh, guidance system. But history of women in programming, and uh, along with the weaknesses of studies based upon psychological differences and commercial needs for, more, uh, for a more diverse uh, technological uh, workplace, we're all missing uh, from the memo circulated uh, by... Uh, Mr. Demore, uh, it argued, amongst other things, that that uh, biology uh, helped explain why women preferred jobs in social and artistic uh, areas to work in hand-edged uh, and uh, c the competitive world of coding, too. Well, coding is, is there, but uh, that's why we need uh, software engineers, and also in uh, the open source movement, things are collaborative. Yes, people work on pieces of the code, but they'll put up uh, for uh, peer review. Now, Linus uh, does, in fact, uh, Trovos, he has the final say on the kernel. And there are other people that maintain parts of the kernel, etc., is a way that it is done. But that way uh, has... Uh, has changed. We used to give uh, seminars on uh, the uh, uh, sociology of, of programming, uh, basically is what it was, uh, from the socialist uh, method. But anyway, nonetheless, responding uh, to the memo is uh, somewhat uh, challenging because it's almost uh, purely dribble, offering up a mixture of fallacies, mindless uh, reductions of populist science and uh, hand-waving at research. It uh, sets out to knock down the view that uh, no reflective person uh, would uh, bow uh, holding uh, that uh, all differences in different groups' re representation in the workforce uh, must be due to bias. And it, and, and it does so with a series of arguments that worthy of a freshman philosophy student. Well, that's the first thing I also noted also, that he was not well grounded in philosophy. Since uh, that the document has uh, kicked up a controversy, shows the issue uh, raises uh, continue to vex uh, Silicon Valley in wake of a painful turmoil at Uber. 
and this constant uh, sexual harassment, etc. In the 50s, uh, we remember uh, that, at least reading about it, and actually seeing uh, some of the results between uh, 30 and 50 percent of uh, programmers were women, in contrast to 20 percent level uh, prevalent in uh, tech today. Uh, it's, it's probably less than that. The uh, share of women in uh, technology plummeted in the 80s when uh, the personal computer appeared and professional prestige began to shift from hardware engineering towards uh, software engineering. Uh, we remember that. We got into the uh, game of, of technology in 1988 and I clearly remember that. And prior to that, we actually sold uh, the uh, VIC-20, the Commodore VIC-20 the uh, Commodore 64 set it up for people, uh, did some of the programming, but that was more uh, oriented uh, towards uh, the uh, small uh, business market. Prior to that, uh, with the mainframes, which he's talking about in the article, women were there, and it was uh, basically uh, what Marx talked about, uh, typewriting. In other words, women were in a clerical at one time, uh, prior to uh, the war, the Great War, World War II, uh, you would see men that were actually uh, secretaries, if you can believe that, or clerical people. But it began uh, a lower uh, status, so women went in there and the pay uh, paralleled with it. In other words, it was a low-paid occupation. It's sort of like nursing and uh, teaching. Uh, fewer men went into it because of opportunities as other opportunities arose in society. We had a typical situation happen during the so-called dot-com boom, for those that were around. Many uh, European males uh, forego uh, uh, professional schools, uh, i.e. law school, uh, medical school, to go directly into entrepreneurial uh, roles. It was a, a libertarian a crapshoot out there. And many of those companies are long gone. Now, Google was not there at the time. It, it came after the boom. But again, this sort of shows what happens with the work here and uh, basically how it is done. And that we go back to that using a biological differences between, I'm back to the uh, piece in the Financial Times, to uh, justify differences in uh, social outcomes is a strategy uh, with a uh, dreary history. It uh, was once argued that differences in the size of male and female brains uh, reflected a superior male intelligence. Now we know that uh, that it is a uh, brain or organ it is a, a brain's organization activities not the size that affects uh, the intelligence. Others have relied on IQ tests to argue women are less able, but only, uh, but uh, not only is uh, the measuring of intelligence tricky, it is uh, difficult to know whether uh, any measurement uh, differences are innate or the results of conditioning, that's environmental conditioning. Recent studies that show women are uh, narrowing the uh, measured IQ gap, even uh, beating men as they are given a better access to the workforce. No doubt about that. IQ does improve. Uh, studies have shown that over time. Ultimately, however, the arguments about absolute differences between uh, men and women are beside the point. It is clear from history and social science that bias and inequality uh, do not uh, do have an effect excuse me, on the composition of the workforce. No doubt about that. And there is uh, the economic incentive there. It is also equally clear that removing this bias is a commercial imperative, not just an ethical one. Well, we don't need to quibble on ethics here. Uh, there have never been ethics in Silicon Valley in the first place. Changing technology and consumer needs require more diverse uh, tech, co tech companies, no doubt about that. And uh, Mr. Demore talks about um, coding uh, people that do the so-called hard coding back uh, type work as opposed to those that do the front that you see, the GUI, you know, with the, the uh, GUI. That is a more intuitive testing has to be done, but the customer actually understands what they're, 
how they're trying to get the information there. And a lot of this information uh, is uh, is set up uh, for the uh, the business interest. Now, it's a different thing, consumer software. Uh, what Microsoft was able to do, and he, they talk about this. Um, uh, the uh, Stefan uh, talks about it a little bit, but what happened on uh, PC DOS and how Microsoft came out there. But he attributed it to uh, lawsuits and those sorts of things. But actually what happened there, and there's a history of this, for us old timers have been around. If you bought the hardware, they gave you the OS. Now we're back to, to that again. If you buy the Google uh, phone, you get Android free. And I guess in the future you'll get Fuchsia. But nonetheless, uh, those are things that come along. It was tradition in the business period. No one was selling the OS. Microsoft uh, sold the DOS, period. Uh, originally, they, uh, with uh, IBM, it was embedded uh, in uh, the EEPROM, in other words, in the operating system, and it would uh, start up, and then you'd put in individual, like Chris, if you wanted a word processor, but uh, with um, the Microsoft uh, situation, you had the PC, and you put in your your DOS disk that came with it, et cetera, and other kinds of programming. It would flopped out. You didn't have hard drives in those days, so it was a different situation. Then we had it actually on the hard drives, and then Windows 1.1, uh, I believe, came out. But Unix was already there, and Unix was a microcomputer. Now, that was when the mail started to make the move in uh, software because the women were still on the mainframes. In the 80s, they took a big hit. Nonetheless, uh, speech recognition uh, software uh, similarly is uh, is uh, better at understanding male voices and female voices. It used to be a voice uh, developer, so again, that has a lot to do with who's doing it. Anyway, the use of male uh, mannequins, mannequin, <coughs> excuse me, mannequins in uh, car safety tests means that uh, the uh, safety features were designed to protect <coughs> excuse me, the average man. But now many of the drivers are female, and probably over 50% actually are. It may help to explain why women are more likely to be injured in a similar road accidents than men. The design of the products have uh, a direct impact on whom the uh, products uh, delights and who it disappoints. Google uh, fired the author of the uh, memo while it was within its rights to do so, whether this was wise, given the uh, company's uh, off, uh, repeated commitment to openness is a hard question. No doubt about that. No one would argue that uh, particular case, but in the end, if we look at this dialectically, it's better for Silicon Valley and Google that uh, Mr. DeMore wrote his crappy memo, we'll call it, and put it out there for all uh, to see how long he will stay in the news. Not really certain about that uh, because, again, diversity is not done for the subjects of it, i.e. for women or uh, African Americans, Latinos. It is done as a business response. Google's and the rest of the world know, for instance, uh, their focus on younger people in Africa, the 122 nations there, that they have to have people look like them. So, therefore, Google is all over uh, Nairobi, Kenya, and uh, so is uh, the other um, uh, IBMs there uh, with Watson, etc. Anyway, the lesson uh, for companies is simple. Repeat this message until it sticks, and the best reasons to build a more diverse workforce is uh, to build a company that performs better. And no doubt, no doubt about that, a company would not do this. Let's quickly go uh, to Margaret uh, Hamilton. Margaret Hamilton, uh, a computer science, scientist. In fact, she, she coined the term computer engineering, a systems uh, engineer and a business owner, was director of software engineering division at the MIT uh, instrumentation laboratory and uh, developed on flight a software for the Apollo program. In uh, 1986, she became the founder and CEO of Hamilton Technologies in Cambridge, Mass. 
This is uh, from the Wikipedia. She was presented with the uh, Medal of Freedom uh, from uh, by uh, President Barack Obama for her work in developing the onboard flight software for the NASA's Apollo Moon mission. So she was a uh, pro- or is a programmer par excellence. She's 80 years old now. She was born in 1936 in uh, Paley, uh, Indiana. Uh, that's where she was born. She was at the University of Michigan in mathematics, earned a B.A. in mathematics with a minor in philosophy from Earlham uh, Con- uh, College. She taught high school math and French upon graduation in order to support her husband, who was, uh, they moved to Boston, and uh, she had the intention of uh, studying extra, uh, abstract mathematics at Brandeis. Uh, stepson went to Brandeis. She cites a uh, female uh, math professor who uh, was a role model uh, for her. She was with the Sage Project. I'm just kind of highlighting it very quickly. As she joined uh, Charles uh, Draper's uh, laboratory at MIT, she was there, and you'll see a picture of her standing uh, by the program that they had uh, written. It's taller than Miss Hamilton there. So some of the things that uh, that happened there. She was in business, a number of different high-order software, a number of different companies, and had found her own. Uh, The company developed what was called a universal systems language there, and various awards that she received along the way. And she was the one that uh, actually coined the term uh, software uh, engineer. Before that, they were not. In fact, uh, there was not even computer science departments, though they were part of the uh, math department at one time. So there is an evolution uh, going on here uh, that uh, that people have to look to and why it was. It was done as an economic imperative. So to Mr. DeMore, what I can say is you have diversity at Google. Diversity is coming to Silicon Valley, and although at not a very good uh, pace, a very slow pace, but it's coming because of market demands. It's not coming because of, quote-unquote, the political collect- correctiveness of the uh, management team are there. He goes on to cite uh, the uh, CEOs, how hard they work. He wants to have a regular life. <clears throat> well, he will have a regular life now, no doubt about that. He will not be at uh, Google. He will be elsewhere. But the reason we brought this to you is that to explain where open science, the open, excuse me, open source software, hardware, open culture, they all intertwine around what the people at uh, Google purport to do. Now, yes, there are these diversity training shops there uh, where they orient the uh, particular workshop in a certain uh, era. Uh, a direction, I should say, and a lot of this is just simply a PR, uh, no doubt about that. Older Moore is right about that in that sense, but he understood that. But he evidently, according to his own memo, he was reacting uh, to the circumstances. Are we much further along today in open source than we were? Yes. The problem was in open source, and we've talked about this many times, was the libertarians that came into it and tried to pervert it uh, to their own uh, philosophy. Uh, there was uh, one, I forget the fellow's name right now, but uh, it was called a bazaar. After bazaar, where you have uh, many, many different items in a place, sort of like a uh, big garage sale or uh, flea markets. I don't hear those anymore. But the, the whole idea there and bringing the quote-unquote individual within the process. Yes, when the Linux kernel started out, it was uh, because Linux uh, Turbo uh, developed it um, based upon another operating system, Linux. Uh, There we used to sell two kits. But anyway, nonetheless, he came with the kernel, and immediately uh, he was uh, hailed, as one would say, because in this country look to a one-person, but it was never a one-person effort. 
Yes, he came up with some of the code, but they were maintainers there to bring about this thing called Linux kernel. Linux kernel is still there. It's used in servers, used in desktops. Now there are hundreds of projects out there uh, by people that work together collectively. So what we're trying to say here is it went beyond Demor. Demor was talking about a very interesting situation where people were, how they were interviewed based upon their individual knowledge. Well, that is good to a certain point, but as Ms. Hamilton would, would tell you, eventually you have to work with a team. You have to be collaborative. And that is a weakness in uh, the current uh, uh, software development. It doesn't mean that if you, say, for instance, are in Boston and somebody's in the deli, that they cannot collaborate on what they're doing. Yes, they can. You don't have one uh, programmer or one coder working on the great program because no matter how great your program is, you have to put a front end or a GUI on it and depending on what it what you plan to do with your program. Say for instance with Android, there are thousands of Android developers out there that develop on the Android system. Google put it out there, yes, they've been proved, I think it's what seven point one or seven point two now. And they'll go to Fuchsia, a different system. It runs on the Linux kernel, at least the current one does. So it is there. You can get it uh, and improve upon it, uh, period. Uh, and you set up your app on the uh, uh, for the smartphone. And there's also, incidentally, a version to run on the desktop. But that's neither here nor there. But these are some of the things uh, that are out there. And But to make this work... You're dealing with millions of customers. You're dealing with different language sets. You're also dealing with the client, which is a smartphone, and you want to turn it, uh, like what Linux does, into more of a server thing. So with people, say, in India and other places, once they get to a Wi-Fi connection, computer conne- connection, uh, uh, actually, in the, in the sense of the uh, smartphone, get to a connection, and then they can cache... Uh, events on their smartphone. So in other words, if the connection goes down, they will still have this information until they can get it back up again. And in the U.S., many other countries, the smartphone has become the personal computer. You can do everything there. And in urban areas, it is no doubt the Android phone. iOS, that's the Apple version, is also there. But they've replaced the desktops just as Intel or any of the people that do hardware anymore, uh, they're not doing very much today. Again, that is an economic uh, uh, situation. doesn't have anything to do with what Mr. DeMore is talking about there. But the days of the great hardware is gone. You don't know. I mean, you can have a processor. Uh, uh, Qualcomm has mixed processors and various other people make processors that are in your uh, mobile phone. And people really don't look at that. They look uh, primarily at the style, but to look in the phone. I hope you like this uh, uh, telecast. Tell us a little bit more about it from WBRN Radio on the 9th of August, 2017. This is an open source report. Incidentally, what we're doing here is we are starting to make up for the time that we missed our open source reports. And hopefully we'll move past Mr. DeMore and uh, Google, and on to uh, some of the new technology that has been setting around. Hopefully this week we'll have another open source report, and on our political program, Boston Red, uh, we will have uh, more on uh, Mr. DeMore and other things, including uh, the crisis, I guess you want to call that, uh, on the uh, Korean uh, Peninsula, and other shenanigans that's going on out there. Good day. Radio and so on. And uh, I did a video response to it recently. And after I put out the video response, we found out that uh, James had been uh, fired from Google. So we, we wanted to talk to James, or I wanted to talk to James, to find out what it's been like and what his thought process were in, in producing this uh, article, this, this series of arguments. And what the response has been like and, you know, what it's like to be in, in the very center of one of these highly controversial but absolutely necessary conversations that society needs to have. So, James, I really, really appreciate you taking the time uh, today. Yeah, thanks. 
Now, your thought process, I know that you had complained mm-hmm. in the past to a labor relations board about what was going on in your work environment. But uh, I, I also know that you, you've you been a researcher at Princeton, at Harvard, at MIT, you got a master's degree uh, in biological systems and so on. Can you just give us a sense of your intellectual growth towards the memo that was recently, um, I guess, elevated to a uh, center mm-hmm. of the firestorm status? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I guess in general, I just really like understanding things. And recently I've... You know, through interactions with different people, I've noticed just how different political ideologies sort of divide us in many ways. And what I wanted to understand what was behind all of that. And so I, I read a lot into Jonathan Haidt's work and a lot of uh, like what is actually the philosophy behind all of these things. And that led me to uh, at least the beginning of the document. And what was it in the writers that you read, I think it was, that you found sort of like the illumination moment, the moment of like, aha, this is going to make some of the jigsaw puzzles fit into place? I guess just I, I could see that all of us are really blind to the other side. And so in these environments where everyone is just in the same echo chamber, just talking to themselves, then they're totally blind to so many things. And we really need both sides to be talking to each other about these things and, and you, trying to understand sorry, Andrew, each other. Because you had a very interesting critique at the beginning. Uh, and I, you know, mm-hmm. people will, will link to the full document below. And I'll, I'll talk about how shameful it was that so many outlets said, well, we basically, we've edited the document a little bit. And, you know, we've removed some charts. And one <laughs> of the major media outlets was had, had removed all of your sources and said, you know, it's curiously mm-hmm. unsourced. It's like, oh, come on, that's, you know, you've got to be kidding me. This isn't even close to, to believable. But um, you had an interesting critique of the left and the right, yeah. neither of which are particularly satisfying for a sort of fleshed out philosophy of the world. I wonder if you could Go over that sort of briefly and, and give people your thoughts on the strengths and weaknesses you see of these two political paradigms. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so I guess some, some of the easiest uh, ways of understanding, say, the left is it's very open, it's looking for changes, it just, and while the right is more closed and uh, wants more stability. And there's definitely advantages to both of those. Sometimes there are things that you need to change, but you also need a vision for what you actually want. And there's a lot of value, for example, in tradition, but not all traditions should be how they are, you know? And yeah, I, so I sort of get a, a sense, like, you know, sort of ancient classical Chinese civilization that was like the same year after year, century after century, sometimes it seemed like millennia after millennia, versus really, really chaotic times like the 1960s where there seems to be like a real pedal to the metal kind of gas acceleration of change mm. to the point where people can't even keep up and cultures can't adapt to it. Yeah. And I, I, what I found also very interesting was that these create biases for ourselves. And so this is particularly interesting when we talk about how it relates to reality. And so both sides are biased in certain ways and they want to, they have motivated reasoning to see uh, what they want out of a lot of things and so this happens a lot in social sciences where where it's 95 percent leaning to the left and so they only study what they want and they only see the types of things that they want and they really aren't that critical of their own research as much as they should and uh, yeah, yeah you, you can no no go ahead I'll, I'll hold my foot and i so the popular conception is just that you know, the right doesn't understand science at all, and it's anti-science. And it's true that they often deny evolution and climate science, but or climate change, but the left also has its own things that it denies. So biological differences between people, in this case, uh, you know, sex differences. What was it that you saw? So you started in Google at, at 2013 and just sort of geek to geek. Mm. Uh, I wanted to get a sense of, of how you'd gotten so much into computers, how you learned how to program, because, of course, your degree wasn't in that. Where was yeah. it that you first developed this sort of talent or ability with, with computers? And what were your first impressions in 2013 when you started as a software engineering intern? Yeah, so I, 
I never really was a science or a computer science major. I was a, as a kid, I made a computer or a calculator games, but <laughs> just, that was just, just like for all fun. The women I knew. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I guess I, I got into chess. And so I, I that like was a couple years of my life. So I, I stopped doing anything related to computers and how I actually got into Google was I found these uh, coding competitions. It's just, you know, these puzzles that you have to solve within a certain time. And I did well enough. I made it to the semifinals or something for Google's and they just recruited me out of that. Right. And I, it, and Google obviously is, you know, a dream job. They have huge benefits. And so I was happy to, uh, go there. And Google has always been like, I, I love Google. So, you know, Android, I was always an Android fanboy and stuff. Now, when you started to, to work at Google and I've, I spent a lot of time in the IT world as I've been an entrepreneur uh, in the IT world, hired a lot of coders. And one of the things that I've noticed, I'm telling me this is purely anecdotal, right? So we want to draw a line between the science we'll be talking about in a bit and just the anecdotal stuff, uh, James. But for me, the engineers who worked most closely with the code and, and particularly like the, the base layers, right? Like not, not the user interface stuff and all that, but the real base layers of the software, a lot of them tended to be more conservative. And I have this sort of vague association in my brain, tell me if this accords with your experience or not, which is that when you're working deep in the bowels of the software, it's like, it better work. You have to be objective. It's all factual. You can't will anything. And you don't have to worry about people. Like the user interface people, they're always like, well, what would the people do? And how would they swipe? And what would they do? And so on, right? And mm -hmm. I think that there may be an association between software engineering and conservatism because you're dealing with logic, facts, reality, that if an evidence-based argument comes along or a really tightly reasoned argument comes along because of all of the training that goes into and all the experience that goes into dealing with facts, reality, and evidence and the empirical question of does it work? Is it faster? Is it more efficient? Does it use less memory or whatever? Have you found any association between software engineers and conservatism? Is that somewhat boxed into my experience, or is that more general, do you think? Uh, so at least personality-wise, one of the two biggest differences between the left and right is the left is often more open, so openness to new ideas. And uh, so that's why often academia is so left-leaning. Uh, but the right is, has higher conscientiousness which is also very useful. So I guess in this very low level type work where you're just debugging all the time and you really have to persevere to get these things going, that would be something that maybe more conservative people would excel at. Yeah, I mean, I, I know what you're saying about the openness of the left. Mm -hmm. You know, in, in my experience, I mean, I went to a bunch of Canadian universities. A lot of them were kind of on the left, uh, as, as was the theater school that I, I went to, in my opinion. I didn't find them to be particularly open to non-leftist ideas. <laughs> so, you know, like, yeah. hey, this helps us accelerate the leftist agenda. I'm really open to it. It's like, wait a minute, this evidence-based, <laughs> science-based argument retards the leftist agenda. I must attack and destroy it using ad hominems. I don't know that it's openness as a whole because openness as a whole to me uh, comes more out of people who just sort of reason and evidence based. There is like, mm -hmm. okay, well, if this is what the reason and the evidence is, I guess we have to go that way. Uh, scientists to me uh, tend to be more open, but they're open with standards. Whereas yeah. the left seems to me more open, like cool, enthusiastic, advances our agenda. I don't know. Like if you say, well, Google is a really a company that you know, it's dominated by leftist politics, really open to, to new arguments, new ideas. It's like, well, you did put out this set of arguments. And they did not appear to be overly open to it. Yeah, I think that's partly just a symptom of the echo chamber that we were in. Mm. And so if we were in a more understanding environment where the two sides actually talk to each other, then hopefully at least they would be more open to ideas that run counter to their internal morals. And when you were there or in the, I guess, maybe the Silicon Valley culture as a whole, mm -hmm. I mean, I know there are conservatives. I know <laughs> there are non-leftists, you know, in the same way, yeah. you know, like to me, if, if you look at a picture of like a, I don't know, like a frat or, or a, a school, a university, an all-male university from like, 
a hundred years ago, you know there are some gay guys there. You know that for a fact, but they're just, you know, they're kind of underground, they're in the closet and so on. Mm -hmm. Is there a significant proportion, do you think, of people in Silicon Valley who are not on the left or who are skeptical of the left, but who really keep themselves hunkered down and silent because of a fear of this kind of mm -hmm. backlash? So, yeah, definitely those aren't on the left. I feel like they need to stay in the closet and not really reveal themselves and actually mask and say things that they don't believe. Uh, I think one thing that maybe, and I haven't really looked at this too deeply, is that there are a lot of libertarians, so which yeah. would be sort of independent of the left and right, because the, at least according to Jonathan Haidt's work, the libertarian mindset is actually very logical, and so which would fit with coding. Yes. No, and I, I think, you know, for me, when I first got into philosophy, I loved, loved, loved the logical rigor of it. And when mm. I first became aware of, I mean, I always kind of knew this in science, but in philosophy, that evidence really matters. Uh, and uh, mm. you don't just sort of come up with all these theoretical constructs and impose them on the world like a cookie cutter, like, you know, this idea, well, communism is just this way, it's right, and we're going to impose it no matter how many bodies pile up. Once I kind of mm. got how important evidence was and became a real empiricist, Oh, you, you, I mean, to me, the, the coding that I did was, was sort of logical and empirical. The philosophy that I did was logical and empirical. The show that I run now, we, I mean, I work as hard as I can to be logical and empirical, though it is tough sometimes when it goes against your pre-existing ideas. But that does mm -hmm. seem to be, I think, kind of, um, I guess, a uh, meeting point or a synchronicity between libertarianism and coding which is interesting mm -hmm. because I do get a lot of social justice warrior vibe coming, coming out of Silicon Valley. Uh, and to me, it's always like, okay, well, libertarians and rational people have created all this cool economic productivity. And now the company is so wealthy, it can afford to hire a bunch of social justice warriors. And then things go from there. <laughs> yeah. And I mean, there's definitely some, I, I think a lot of the entrepreneur mindset is sort of, Libertarian, just you know, self-reliance, and I, I. I mean, Peter Thiel is libertarian. I. I don't think Sergey Brin, our uh, co-founder, has really declared himself one way or the other. But I've always interpreted the things that he said to be very not uh, partisan. Like he's always wanted the two sides to talk to each other, which is, and he's very unpolitically correct in a lot of the things that he says. So, yeah, I, I think that he may identify as libertarian, but and it's interesting does not want to say it. <laughs> yeah, well, I can understand why yeah. these days, and particularly, you know, as you get big uh, as a corporation, you know, Microsoft had this issue. IBM, it was brutal. I think it was in the 80s that it started. IBM, one of them say, oh, well, you know, Microsoft just kind of took uh, PC DOS away from IBM and ran with it. Yeah, but one of the reasons for that was that IBM got dragged in by the Department of Justice into like this 13-year soul-crushing battle of antitrust uh, prosecution. Mm -hmm. And boy, that's going to just, people just don't want to work there. Oh, I'm going to spend the rest of my career in depositions? No, thanks. <laughs> I, think, <laughs> I think not. And this, you know, when you get to be a big enough company, you know, I, I criticize Google for some degree. I also fully am sensitive to the, to the reality that they're living in a kind of hair trigger, lawsuit happy Department of Justice. I mean, you know, I mean, mm -hmm. if, if Clinton had gotten into the business environment, I mean, he, she wouldn't be repealing like 16 to 1, like for every, like Trump had this thing, like for every new regulation to have to be canceled. He's like 16 to 1 or 18 to 1 cancellations to new. That um, wouldn't have been the case if Hillary had gotten in. And you do, as a big company, have to live in this highly uh, litigious world and and i mean mm -hmm. there's a lawsuit already going on uh, against um uh, google for um pay pay disparities and so on so it is a, a real challenge to operate in that kind of environment and you don't want to get sucked into one of these like endless um legal actions uh, in particular if it's department of justice based i mean they'll just drain your will to live if you're a big corporation so i am sensitive to the fact that when you bubble up something like this and we'll get to the thought process in a sec if that's right with you yeah. When you bubble up something like this, they have to look at that in in a sort of big legal picture framework and say, okay, well, mm -hmm. how does this position us with this, that, and the other, and all the other things that, that could possibly go on? And it may not be a decision, like your termination may not be solely related to 
well, this is just bad think and we got to get rid of this guy. But there may be very big concerns, which, you know, mm-hmm. maybe you or I aren't particularly aware of. Yeah. It, for sure, Google is under a ton of pressure on multiple fronts and throughout the globe. So it definitely complicates things. Yeah. Now, what was your thought process around this? I, I, I wish I had the right word for it, James. You know, it's been called all these, you know, nonsense screed. You know, it's like a, it's, it's an essay, an argument, a perspective. But I think an argument is better because it's tightly reasoned. It's got lots of source notes and so on. Did you have like that Jerry Maguire moment where it's like, I'm going to write this thing? Or was it just something you're making notes for yourself and you, you built the case and you thought, well, this is important to share? Or what was the process of uh, generating the, the arguments? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I... So I, I went to a diversity program at Google, and you know, it was all, you know, it wasn't recorded at all. It was totally secretive. And, you know, I heard things that I definitely disagreed with in some of our programs. And uh, so I, I had some discussions with people there, but it was, there was a lot of just shaming and, you know, no, you can't say that. That's, that's sexist. You can't do this. And like, there's just so much uh, hypocrisy in a lot of the things that they're saying. But uh, so I, I decided to create the document just, you know, to clarify my thoughts. And also, I had to fly to China for work. So I had a 12 hour flight to fill my time with. So <laughs> that was one motivation. <laughs> right. And then did you have a sense beforehand of, I mean, obviously you knew it would be controversial and, and so on. And controversy to me is fine. You know, people can, people advance like arguments I consider mental half the time, but, you know, as a public intellectual or whatever. Yeah. And sometimes they pan out and, and sometimes they don't. I sort of try and be open to these kinds of perspectives. So I, I guess you were aware of the controversy. Um, mm-hmm. h- how did it play out relative to your expectations? <laughs> Yeah, I guess this is going back to some of how each side has blind spots. And this was definitely one of my blind spots. As you know, a very logical person, I laid out my arguments. I specified exactly what's causing this. I even outlined what the like, ex- response may be, you know, all this PC silencing. And, but they did exactly that. So <laughs> I couldn't really get ahead of it at all. And so I I did share the document multiple times, like a month ago, and many people looked at it, but no one ever had this explosive reaction. All the responses were just rational discussion. Right. So you shared it internally, uh, and then would you know how it kind of got out and metastasized from there, like escaped and, and supernova from there? Uh, yeah, so there were the people writing on Twitter and they were all against it. They were just calling me, you know, all these misogynist racist terms and stuff. And so I think it was, they got in contact with Gizmodo, I think maybe hypothetically. And, uh, then it was, it was likely from there that it was leaked, but I, I'm pretty sure it wasn't anyone connected to me because they would have asked me first and they wouldn't have removed all the citations and, messed up the formatting and stuff. <laughs> right. No, they, they really did take it from what I thought was, you know, a fairly academic, very professionally put together uh, set of arguments with extensive citations and graphs and so on. And, 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 you know, the thing is too, like I mentioned this in my sort of video response to it, James, it's like you put a lot of qualifiers in there. A, a lot of, you know, okay, these are group yeah. averages. You can't judge the individual. I mean, all the things that rational people have to say because, Nobody seems to get taught about statistics or anything like that. But, uh, you know, like women in general are shorter than men. Oh, so you're saying that no woman can be taller than a man? It's like, no, I'm not saying that. Oh, please. I wish that government schools were better. <laughs> but um, it is. And, and I remember when I, when I first heard about it, I, I thought, okay, I'm going to read about this. And when I started reading about it, James, first of all, there were no quotes. And when there's no quotes from the document, I know, I know it's 
reasonable. <laughs> Usually, it's like, well, we can't quote from it. We're going to give you our interpretation. And then yeah. I found it really hard to find the original document, like what you'd actually written. And then I thought, mm. oh, man, okay, this is going to be really reasonable now. This is going to be really evidence-based. <laughs> this is going to be really factual. And then I finally found one, and they said, well, we've made some edits, and <laughs> we've taken out some charts. And I'm like, what? Why, why are you hiding it? If, if this guy's crazy, just let, let the crazy speak for itself. And then I finally, like it took forever, finally found one. It's like, I hear the sources, here are the charts. And I'm like, damn, this guy's really reasonable. This is important stuff for us to be talking about. This is science. This is factual. Uh And uh, according to Breitbart, there are four, I think, psychologists or sociologists or some combination who've said, yeah, the the guy's science is bang on. This is well accepted within the psychological community. This is well accepted within the biological community. This is well accepted products of evolutionary psychology and evolutionary biology. This guy's science is bang on. I haven't seen any actual scientist or any of the people you've cited say, no, 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 he got this, he's misusing my work, he's, he's got it totally yeah. wrong. The, all the professionals, all the people who actually study this stuff, they're like, yeah, this is, he, he, he's right, you know, I don't agree with everything he's written, but as far as the science goes, he's, he's bang on. And this, to me, is the really surprising thing, because people are characterizing what's happened to you as, you've been fired for having an unpopular opinion, you've been chastised for having an unpopular opinion, for being anti... But this is not an opinion that you have, right? And, and I wonder if you can yeah. help people understand that disparity because it's one thing to be fired for being unpopular. It's another thing for being fired for, for, for being right and having the science on your side. That to me is truly astonishing. Yeah, I, I don't really understand it myself yet. I mean, a lot of it is just people got offended because it goes against the left's ideology and – then they just, okay, it defended people, therefore it's wrong. And therefore it's an opinion, because it can't possibly be true if it offends me. I have my own subjective truth or something. I, I don't know. But. It is terrible how... Also, people weren't, from what I can see, the people who were the most offended were the people who had not read what you'd <laughs> written, but the people who had read these exaggerated, doomsday, apocalyptic, nonsense <laughs> interpretations of what you'd said. Uh, yeah. <laughs> you know, you didn't say women are biologically unsuited to be in town. I mean, none of the things that were actually in the document. And that to me is, you know, if there's a, I have this special circle of hell thing going on in my brain these days, <laughs> you know, who, who belongs in what special circle of hell? People who exaggerate factual or, or mischaracterize factual empirical arguments to attempt to goad the mob, mob into the most virulent and vicious hyper-reaction, uh, there is a special circle of intellectual hell for those people because they're stifling an absolutely necessary debate yeah. about these issues in society. Yeah, I think a lot of it is that they feel self-righteous, and so they feel that the ends justify the means. But uh, it's really bad, I think. And what's it been like for you? Again, most people will probably never go through this eye of the hurricane (laughs) storm trial by fire. Hey, good. Uh Pressure turns coal into diamonds. But um, (laughs) what's what's it been like for you? I mean, is is it hard to sleep? Is it hard to concentrate? Is it like, welcome to a side of the world you probably didn't know about really very much until now, and now it's all too vivid? Yeah, it's definitely been hard to sleep. Uh, Especially early on, I was responding to comments from people in Australia and Europe. So I was staying up until like 5 a.m. But uh, it still hasn't truly hit me, the enormity of it all. Well, it's interesting as well, because the stuff that I read at the beginning was, uh, and I thought this was also a, a very strong reaction, this man's life is destroyed. And, and I, don't, I don't think that's true. I don't think that's true at all. And, and in fact, I know that we'll, we'll talk about the job office in, in a second, <laughs> but, you know, you, you've just set up a giant flare saying, I have a lot of courage. <laughs> I, I'm willing to stick by the facts. I'm willing to take a hit for science. I'm willing to take a hit for reason and evidence. I'm willing to take a hit. Now, whether the hit was entirely anticipated, the extent of the hit was entirely anticipated, nonetheless, you you did release something that you knew could be explosive and controversial, and you're not backing down, and you're not groveling, and you're not like, sorry, you know, uh, it's the Galileo thing, you know, but it moves. 
but it moves. What do you want me to say? The Earth is not the center of the universe, but it moves. You can't argue me out of the facts. I mean, I could pretend, uh-huh. but what's the point of that, right? <laughs> and so you've set up this giant flare, which says, like, I value truth over comfort. I value reality over conformity. I value science over, you know, I can't believe they call your stuff pseudoscience. It's like, no, 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 <laughs> diversity is pseudoscience. <laughs> the actual, like, diversity is a strength. Diversity is a benefit. Please show me the studies where this is absolutely proven to be the case, right? Diversity is not a benefit in neighborhoods. I can't find evidence that it's a benefit economically and so on. But nonetheless, you set up a giant flare and people will see that. And tell me what the response has been that has been a, a positive, that has been encouraging. Yeah, so it's surprising. There may be a lot of negative responses in the public, but very few of them actually send me messages because they just want to, you know, virtue signal to all their followers that, hey, I'm a great person, I share your morals, and this person is bad. But they would never, they don't really, they don't want to actually have a debate on why I'm wrong or even confront me. They just want to show how self-righteous they are. And so in contrast, I've gotten a ton of personal messages of support, which has been really nice. And I, I got that before at Google, before all of this leaked, where yeah, it was I mean, uh, a lot of the I, upper management that was shaming me. Right, right. Well, I mean, I, I do think that it is a real shame now because, of course, a lot of people are going to look at your example and say, well, I can't talk about that. Well, I can't talk about this yeah. and so on. And, you know, I have no criticisms about anything that you did, with one exception, James, is that I would say that what you should have done is activated your super secret white male patriarchy shield. You should have activated your privilege shield so that you would sail through this immune from all negative repercussions. Because this kind of stuff, you know, when, when it happens, it's like white privilege. You know, this guy is like basically dragged out into the street, beaten senseless in the court of public opinion, and then fired within, what, 48 hours or something like that of this becoming public knowledge. I don't see a lot of white male privilege rising up around him like these magical shields to protect him. In fact, the white privilege seems to me, or white male privilege seems to me, to be an excuse for people to say, well, I can bully this person because they're so privileged. Uh, anything I say is, uh, is always punching up. So uh, it seems yeah. like white privilege is kind of the opposite of privilege, if that makes any sense. Yeah, there was a surprising amount of attacks that were just at my race and gender, which is exactly what we're trying to avoid with these things, right? right. We want to avoid classifying people just by their group identity. Like that is racism. That is sexism. Now, I wonder if you could just step people... I'm, I'm, we're going to link to the full document. I want people to read it. You need to read this document. It's a great document. It's, it's well put together. It's well sourced. But I know not everyone's going to do it. I, I mean, I wish they would. I, want uh, them to. I know not everyone's going to do it. I wonder if you could just step people through some of the major points that you want to get across for people who mm-hmm. aren't going to end up uh, reading it because again I, I thought it was very thoughtful um very reasonable perhaps too reasonable uh, <laughs> very very conciliatory <laughs> and and uh, it comes i think from a genuine passion for excellence for all parties concerned mm-hmm. yeah so i guess one caveat what i would say to anyone is that i'm not talking about any individual person i'm not talking about reducing anyone to their group identity i'm just saying that if we look at population level distributions, different groups have different distributions of traits, right? Just as we can say that men are have a higher distribution of height than women, for example. And so this isn't important in judging any individual uh, person on how good they are at a job. In fact, I, I'm not saying that any of the female engineers at Google are in any way worse than the average male engineer. I'm, in fact, I'm just saying that this may explain some of the disparity in representation in the population, right? So there may not be so many over here, but those that are over here are just as good. So, uh, and, or not even good, like ability wise, just preference wise with a lot of these things. The, the, personal difference between men and women is just differing uh, interest in people versus things. And this has links to prenatal testosterone. And that explains a lot of the differences in 
a career choice, for example, teacher versus something like coding, where one is more people-oriented and one is more things-oriented. And yeah, so that that's the biggest one that I would say. But then there are some other personality traits that at least have some effect or at least may we should be cognizant of. And maybe if we want to make tech a more female-friendly environment, we should recognize that some women uh, are different than men in these ways. And so if we want to make it more accessible to women, then maybe, for example, cooperativeness, which is higher in women than men, we should make the workplace a place where you can actually thrive if you're cooperative. So a lot of coding now is just very individual. I'm writing my code, and I can be a superstar. I can just write my code for a week and then make this huge system all by myself. But you know, there's ways of pair programming, for example, or just other collaborative things that we can really help improve the workplace. And you know, it would just help good for productivity, maybe. And also in our interview process, for example, it's all individual right now. And it's only how well you work by yourself. But And we never really measure how good someone is on a team, which is really important to how good you perform at your job. And so that may also be disproportionately hurting certain populations. And you had a great argument about status as well. Yeah, yeah I wonder if you could, could refresh uh, people's minds if they haven't read it. Or if they have read it and don't remember, I'm not going to read it. That's a great argument you had there. Yeah, so uh, the drive for status is uh, one also difference between men and women where uh, generally men try to compete in high-risk activities for the possibility of having high status, where status is often just a lot of money. And that also pushes a lot of men into uh, dangerous and otherwise uh, unseemly jobs that like coal mining that are extremely dangerous but pay more.